opening words, and this is the longer version of what I use for closing words, conspiracy. What if we tried to breathe together, pull in, pull deep, release together? What would be born from a unified fulfillment of the bodily self and its undeniable need? What if we all try to breathe together? A shared breath is a moment, refreshment and a reminder of our more than oneness. And if we continue, if we slow and quicken a pace with each other, a murmuration of lungs becomes one organ singing. And if we continue, learn each other's rhythms over time, rising and falling like waves, we become a perfect thing. A conspiracy dancing, a dance of need and met need, request and offering, feeding each other. What if we decided to breathe together? What if we open the airways? What if we unlock, unbind, unfetter the hands that feed us? The earth, the air, and the water that hold us and shape us were breathing together before we find ourselves existing. And so they will continue after we're gone. Imagine our final goodbye coming later than sooner. Imagine our final breaths in paradise. It's not too late to slow down, fall into the dance, catch the vibrating air, and release our lungs into song. Anything breathing cannot help but breathe. But breathing together is a choice we make. And building a better world together is a choice that this congregation has made. And one way in which we hope to fulfill that promise is through the Veach program at Shelter Rock. Good afternoon. On behalf of the Veatch program, the Veatch Board of Governors, and the Veatch staff, welcome to Veatch Sunday and to the Veatch Annual Meeting. My name is Corrine Hayden, and I am the chair of the Veatch Board of Governors. And as is our custom, I will start the meeting by lighting the chalice and giving some additional opening words. Today's opening words are from a 1966 address that Bobby Kennedy made at the University of Cape Town. It is from the numberless diverse acts of courage and belief that human history is shaped each time a man stands up for an ideal and acts to improve the lot of others and strikes out against injustice. Now, these words are appropriate for this Beach Sunday because in 1968, as a living memorial to Bobby Kennedy, shortly after the New York Senator was assassinated during his presidential campaign, the social justice organization, Community Change, that we're here hearing today, was founded in Bobby Kennedy's honor. Again, welcome. For those of you who are present in the worship hall, and then for those of you who are joining us via live stream, it's wonderful to have you here. Beach is a, the national philanthropic giving program of our congregation. It provides long-term core support for social justice organizing throughout the United States. We currently fund 200 organizations, nearly 200, across the country and we are, that are working to sustain our multiracial democracy. Beach is our legacy, 
and it has been a leader in progressive philanthropy since 1959. And as this is our annual meeting, I'd like to invite you to review a full list of the grants that the Veatch Board of Governors awarded in fiscal year 2022. You can visit the UUCSR website and you can see the posting of our annual report and you'll find it under the Veatch blog. We're very proud of our grant making and all of the work that our grantees are doing to put our faith into practice in the wider world. So I hope you were able to join us at the worship service this morning. And then as you would have heard that Dorian Warren is unable to join us this afternoon due to illness, but we are honored to have a close colleague of his, Afia Atamesa, Community Change's Chief of Programs, here with us this afternoon. Afia is an organizer, a strategist, and a movement lawyer. And I look just delighted that actually she could be with us today and the congregation. So now let me turn the microphone over to Joan Maniri, our executive director, so she can further introduce Afia. Thank you, Karine. So I am truly honored and very grateful to Afia Lahat Benson for, for joining us uh, here for Beach Sunday and welcoming her to UUCSR. Afia is the Chief of Programs of Community Change, where she oversees a vast national network of social change initiatives. Her work has improved the quality and quantity of fair and equitable housing. She's defended women's rights and galvanized support for programs benefiting low-income families. I've had the pleasure of knowing Afia for several years now. Before joining Community Change, she served as the executive director of Veach Grantee Community Voices Heard, or CVH, which is a statewide organization based in New York City. At CVH, Afia oversaw grassroots organizing, leadership development, and she created new models of direct democracy. I was an early founder and a longtime board member of CVH before coming to Veach, so Afia's powerful and visionary leadership there is very, very close to my heart. Before her work with CVH, Afia served as the Urban Justice Center's Director of Litigation and Policy for the Safety Net Project. There she led a lawsuit to protect community space in New York City's public housing. Afia was awarded a Fulbright Fellowship in 2008 in support of her work at the International Federation of Women Attorneys advocating on behalf of indigent women in Ghana. She holds a law degree from Fordham University School of Law and a BA in Sociology and African American History from Trinity College. Afia, thank you so much for being with us today. It's wonderful to be with you and we're all really looking forward to this conversation. So we're gonna have a few questions that uh, Afia and I will discuss and as uh, Eileen has handed out some cards, if you have any questions, please jot your questions down. You can indicate them and then Eileen will sort of organize them and we'll have about 15 or 20 minutes at the end of the conversation for you to ask your questions. And we're gonna start really with just uh, asking Afia to talk with us a little bit about what brings you to the work, how did you get started in the work, and to tell us a little bit about your journey to community change. Sure, thank you so much for having me this afternoon. Just a deep appreciation. It is just such a privilege to be back here at Shelter Rock with all of you, so thank you for thinking of having me for Beach Sunday. Um, and just thank you both for that warm welcome. I appreciate it. I'm glad this is taped. I want to show my mom, so this is, um, <laughs> this, this is great. So, you know, that question for me, Joan, of, um, of what brought me to movement, I like to say that I don't think there's kind of one thing that helps steer our directions in life, but a, a culmination. And so I'll, I'll be a bit brief, but I, I want to just make sure you guys know a little bit of who I am and what moves me. Uh, so I'd like to start with I'm the, the daughter of Maxine and Kofi. Uh, and my mom is a Harlemite uh, by way of Antigua. And my father is from Ghana, West Africa, which means our road started in the Bronx. Uh, and so... 
you know, I, I'll say that for me, I was blessed to be born into like a, a very middle class but immigrant kid household, right? The idea, for those of you who know, like if you, if you break your arm, they're gonna band it up and send you to school, right? Like you have to go to school, education. A very loving family. Um, but I, I think part of what brought me into movement was just always having to live in different worlds, right? Like I'm, uh, I would say identifiably black. My name, Afia Atamensa, makes clear that there's an immigrant, likely an African in my household, given all the vowels, right? So these, these differences, uh, were early for me, and I went to majority white schools um, and lived in a diverse neighborhood. So I was always kind of moving in these different circles. Uh, and so for me, part of what moved me in my original journey was just um, about the treatment of, of the women who loved and poured into me. Uh, my story is one that's inextricably linked to black women who, who loved me, who poured into me, who kicked my you-know-what when it needed to happen, and who believed uh, that they should be about pouring into me and other children. And so I'll say I had both the, the benefit and privilege of wa watching women just work deeply hard, um, but also was clear at a young age about inequities and how women were treated. How my aunts, who, uh, some of whom worked very hard to eventually move to Log Island, a wine dance, and had family members who suffer from what we now call the disease of addiction how they were mistreated in the criminal justice system, how they were treated as parents who were trying to get help. Um, and so it initially led me to want to be a lawyer. Uh, and so that's why I started as a public defender at the Legal Aid Society, which also allowed me to see up close the horrors of inequity in different lights. Um, and I'll say that part of that journey as a, a young, I think it was like, Jesus, it feels forever ago now, 24-year-old, um, working as a public defender, defending people who almost exclusively were black and brown, who were my age, uh, definitely left a, an impact on me about what is justice, how systems are work or pre-designed not to work. Uh, but coming up as I did, as I said, uh, this first generation immigrant, particularly Africans, I'm gonna tell you, man, you're either a lawyer, a doctor, an engineer, or what did I come to this country for? <laughs> and so the idea of, of leaving the law to do something like organizing was something that was just foreign as an idea. And so I was continuing in, in practice and, and learning and was blessed to come in contact with some members from this organization called Community Voices Heard. And at that time in my life, I think like a lot of um, people in their early 20s was questioning, right, about what, what am I doing? What is this system where I'm, you know, standing, watching people who are losing their homes, losing their freedom, and me standing there doesn't make me feel like it's fair. Um, and so I was in this moment of questioning and was in space with some members from Community Voices Heard uh, during the Bloomberg administration who were also questioning, but they were doing more than that. They were demanding and challenging. And so I remember a particular meeting where I was and these uh, members, God Spare Her Life, uh, and Bragg, just was speaking in a way to me that resonated because it reminded me of so many of my aunts, right? Just like a clarity, it's not cursing, but just clear and curt. <laughs> um, and so I just walked up to her and what is this community voices heard? And she said, we are not a service organization. We build power for ourselves. And that was captivating for me, the idea of building power for yourself. I had been in reactionary positions most of my life, right? I, I think of my circumstance of, of getting into certain schools based, right? Like defensive, it's not uh, a proactive posture. And so that was intoxicating for me, this idea of these collective of mostly women, almost exclusively women of color who were not just gonna stand in a bread line. They were gonna ask why it was this way as opposed to being able to have the things they need for basic human rights. Uh, and so I say that uh, they radicalized me in an amazing way of these trainings about self-interest and power and issues and demand and about being around other people who are questioning systems. Um, and so I say, as I got clearer in my analysis and in my fear, I just got clear that I was participating in a criminal justice system or a justice system that was functioning at that time as an apartheid court. And it was antithetical to the things that I wanted to do with my life, so I needed to make a shift. And I, after a while, joined Community Voices Heard and started to speak that same song about building power for ourselves, um, creating a world where we can live in dignity, and that we didn't have to have a mindset that was about um, scarcity, that there wasn't enough, that there in fact was enough for all of us to live in dignity and thrive and have just more than our basic needs met, but to live in a world of love, 
Um, and so that's what kind of brought me into movement and, and shaped me. And I'll say that, you know, my journey from that time at Community Voices Heard now to being a part of community change has, I hope, uh, deeply shaped my small children <laughs> who have had a chance to go with me around this great state uh, on behalf of uh, working class and low income people and a little bit around the nation. So that's a little bit of what brought me in. Thank you, thank you. You know, this morning, um, Dorian spoke with us about how democracy is shaped from the ground up. And I guess I wonder, uh, Afia, if you could share with us from your perspective now at Community Change, what's the connection between this work, this like, we're here to build power, you know, and really impacting the development of democracy in our country? What are the, what, how do you see those connections? Sure, thank you for the question. And let me just take a step back to say, in my role now as Chief of Programs, I have the pleasure of, of literally going all across the country to sit and talk with partners who we work with um, in almost every state in this nation. And so I uh, literally just came back Friday evening from Florida, uh, where we have partners, the same of some of the Beach partners, like uh, Miami Worker Center and Florida Rising where we're having conversations about what are the types of campaigns and support we can give when we're dealing right now, if, if I can just be candid here, family, in a state of folks who are actively trying to attack and dismantle our democracy. And if I'm honest, for me, democracy has always been a bit of a trigger word, right? Like, in, in theory, you know, we've been functioning in a democracy and one that was comfortable for folks who look like me and others to not be living in the type of dignity that I was referencing earlier. So at Community Change, a part of what we're talking about with a democracy is a democracy where people actually are clear that they, there's food security, right? Where seniors are able to live in dignity, where folks aren't being evicted. All these types of pieces allow folks to actually actively participate um, to have us have an actual full democracy. And so, you know, Florida is just a microcosm of what we're seeing across the nation where there's laws that are being, right, like uh, rolled back. Uh, to put some of us back in a different position than the, from the, some of the freedoms we fought for, uh, making harder to access the institutions that allow folks to live in full dignity. Uh, you know, while in Florida meeting with some of the partners, it was just something just as simple when I think about it. I passed this bookstore that you have here as some of their uh, members who are, uh, who have family members who are teachers, right? And the fear of their teachers about what, as we come up in Black History Month in a few days, what am I going to talk to my students about? Betty, what can I talk to my students about that's not gonna get me fired? And then the impact that has in communities of color, and I'll say even in white communities, of, of having whole aspects of our history uh, washed away or, or uh, be told that you can't teach to it. So what we're in the middle of now is nothing less than a fight for what this country is going to look like, right? How are we going to relate to one another? How are we going to be able to feel free to even have discourse and conversation and learn? And so, you know, I was uh, sharing with Joan, you know, I, I watch news, right? I hear the radio. Um, but going there and just seeing firsthand about some of the campaigns, some of the conversations we're having about how to do uh, almost a parallel education system to allow folks to have a full understanding of the people's history of this nation and of the state of Florida. Uh, thoughts on how they're going to be able to even carry out protests when there have been laws that have made aspects of protest illegal now, right, in 2023 in the United States of America. Uh, you know, I, previous to being in Florida, I was in Georgia uh, right around the, the election where organizers on the ground were trying to figure out how to ensure that our elderly uh, residents who were waiting in what's been clearly documented as six and seven hour lines are able to be fed and nourished when there were laws that were targeting them for doing something as simple as offering someone some food and beverage while they're waiting in line. And so I know these are all things that you've heard, but I lay them out just to be clear about what's actually happening right now in real time on the ground in our nation, not somewhere else where we need to send aid, not something that happened decades ago. We are living in this right now. And so part of our theory on building from the ground up is first and foremost that we are going to walk side by side with impacted communities to think about what are the solutions that will allow people to live in their communities in dignity. And I'm just gonna flag you and hear me say that word like a million times. Uh, Cause I just think it's a founding of like something, what's something central that people from all stripes can agree on, this idea of dignity, 
right? That you can make choices for yourself and your family, that you're able to be loved and have that space and that you're trusted to be able to make choices. I feel it's just something that's so kind of like a central part of fabric. And so, you know, in some of these spaces, I have to say, supportive institutions like Beach is pivotal. Um, all across the country, but I'll say particularly in some of the southern states, it's been, at times, aspects of faith have been used as a tool of destabilizing our nation. So to be here amongst you all in an institution that's clear that faith is not just a conversation, but walking in that faith, and giving in a way that allows others to walk in that faith, and be guided by this idea of dignity is um, something that I hope you all uh, fully digest, and I hope that I'm able to articulate a deep appreciation for, um, because it's no small thing. Uh, so when you ask me this idea about democracy and what is community change looking to build, I, I wanna say it's just this radical vision of people can eat when they're hungry. <laughs> they have shelter, right? They can be clothed. Folks of different identities are able to live without fear of persecution, fear of jailing, fear of losing their job for speaking something crazy called the truth. Uh, and trying to do this day by day in, in this crazy basic tenet of organizing of these one-to-one -one relationships. So we go out, we talk to people, we share a bit of our story, hoping they'll share a bit of theirs, and that we can find some connective tissue that will allow us to do something, to take some collective action together. And that is in all types of facets in different ways. As I'll go back to the example of Florida and school boards, people coming together to say we support teachers. Um, we, uh, you hear here a lot about the, uh, like the food refrigerators where people will put up the fridges and store it with food. And so we are in relationship with people who wanna build an open democracy that allows for all of this, uh, actively trying to strategize on how to deal with the, I would say visceral blowback <laughs> of people who have been uh, empowering themselves by voting and, and encouraging others. Uh, so it is, it is something we see as a long haul, you know, I will say this is a generational uh, fight, us locking arms in arms and saying that we have a shared vision, that we want to build something stronger and that we're going to do it together. So uh, I hope that's clear. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. This is amazing. And I, I guess I want to just remind you, if you have questions, you know, jot them down. Eileen will start to gather them and we'll put some questions together uh, to engage in dialogue. Um, with Afia, I just want to pick up on, on something that you're that you're um, you're mentioning, uh, Afia, which is you know part of the evolution of community change. We talk about it being founded in the '60s in honor of, of Bobby Kennedy, but over the last few years, especially, it has really stepped very firmly into developing the leadership of immigrants, black-led leadership, and really looking at like who represents this work on the ground how that work is supported, you know, work that we're clearly committed to here at Veach, but there's so much work to be done. And I wonder if you could speak to that directly. What are you seeing on the ground and how can we be a part of that? Sure, 100%. I mean, part of how I came to this position now is when I was at Community Voices Heard, we also engage with community change. Um, and this, I'd say, repositioning over the last decade of community change, saying that we are directly going to focus and center on organizations that are led by women of color, particularly blacks. Um, we're going to focus and center uh, our immigration fights with uh, leaders from those impacted communities. And I think it's based on a few things, just part of what our, our mission and values align about building from the ground up, right? Building that power is a direct alignment of saying we are going to support both the leadership of and organizations that are led uh, by those uh, impacted. And then, you know, also I'll say it's, it, this goes to a little something that I, in my experience as a, I guess a former and current Beach fundee, of putting in long term, right? Like saying we are gonna walk this road with you. The leadership development piece is, is integral. We have several cohorts across the nation um, for women of color who come together and learn from each other as leaders of organizations. I don't have to tell many of you that it's been some difficult times in the midst of COVID, right? You're going from running a non-for-profit institution uh, that is taking up battles with Herculean adversaries, I will say, and in the midst of all that, 
right? You're kind of both battling that and, and battling what it looks like to make sure that your, your staff is safe during this difficult time. I know many people who are working are still dealing with that kind of remote versus hybrid, right? So how are these folks who are doing so many things able to be in a space where they can be candid and vulnerable and get support? Um, I was part of one of those programs and it was amazing for me and we're proud that we're able to continue that type of investment in leaders who can come together and and just share, but also learn on how we're going to set right some things that have been set askew. Um, similarly, I'll, I'll say that we have decided to continue uh, as organizations grow, right, to help them as they continue to move from elemental of just like understanding what it is to put folks together and do the organizing as they get to intermediate and learn about how to put together complex campaigns. I'll say for us as a national organization that both understands that we take our direction from the leaders in the states. I mean, something that's been amazing here is being able to put together the sums of these amazing organizations and the individuals that lead them across the nation. So I talked a little bit about uh, what I've been seeing going on in Florida, but we also have groups in, in Texas and here in New York. And so even being able to thread that needle of being able to have these organizers come together um, at the behest of community change to be in a room and say, hey, so this is what's going on with housing in Florida. This sound a lot what's going on in Brooklyn right now, right? And folks in Houston are able to make kind of that same link and then come together um, and start building regional and national campaigns that are able to ask some of these larger questions about who is benefiting from them, these predatory laws, what, you know, what's going on here. So that has been part of the practice and fiber of community change. I think kind of coming from an organization that was right, founded at that time after these assassination attempts and to be able after 50 years to continue moving forward and still being relevant because we take our direction um, from the folks who are telling us exactly what they're seeing day to day with their members. And it's been a blessing to be a part of it. That's really, that's really great. I, I think, um, I wonder if you could, could give some examples of BO. You know, when we were chatting earlier, we talked about how important it is to just get out of Zoom and get on the ground and get out and, and meet with people. And you've been doing some of that. Um, we have as well, our governors were able to travel together to the state of Oregon and, and meet with some of our, our grantees. And there is just nothing like just actually standing in a courtyard uh, with a group like Pakun and, and meeting the leadership and, and hearing about the work on the ground. And I, I guess I could, I wonder if you could share some examples of how this is, how, what this looks like on the ground from your perspective. Sure, I appreciate the question. And as I've said, I've had the privilege of being able to travel a lot over this last year. And I, I think a great example, and I'll say it, it uh, touches me closely as a, a mother of two small kids, is this fight for, for funded childcare across the nation. And we've been blessed to be in relation for more than a decade with an amazing organization, Olay, organizing in the land of enchantment, enchantment in New Mexico, who just had a historic win, if you haven't heard about it, it's the first country in the nation, little New Mexico, to have funding of uh, education from birth all the way to 12K in their constitution, right? Uh, and so I was able to go to New Mexico uh, for a few weeks in, in November to walk with them as they're knocking doors, right, to get people to vote on this ballot initiative. And so what comes out of this is one, huge, they won. Uh, but now, of course, right, like, uh, uh, success has many uh, mothers, right? So people are, uh, across the nation are also saying, hey, we catching heck too around childcare. We too need access to fully funded childcare for our children. And so we have leaders in New Mexico talking across the country to our, what we've called our child care change makers, which is in 33 states across this nation of individuals, primarily moms who are coming together and saying, I am tired of half of my check <laughs> going to pay for child care. So it has been both awe-inspiring and amazing that in the midst of some horrific backlash to our democratic institutions that people continue to come together and move forward an idea that will, even though based in uh, making sure that we're centering women, people of color, and other affected, who actually changes the world for almost everyone, right? When there's more income in the household, when people are able to go back to work, when you have that support. So this is just one of several campaigns that we are a part of and have been seeing folks just energized by um, guaranteed income, during COVID, right, where there's something crazy that went on when the government started putting money in people's hands and trusting them to make decisions for them and their family, right? There was a lot of uh, 
with fear mongering going on, it reminds me of kind of the heyday of what made CVH founding, right? Of the welfare queen and what are these folks gonna, they're just gonna buy sneakers or something. People did something crazy. They bought clothes for their kids. They saved money, <laughs> right? They were able to make choices that allowed folks to be able to kind of put their shoulders down a little bit without having all the intense stress of what if this check doesn't come? What if, I don't know if folks saw that New York Times article that was about a year ago that most families are about $800 emergency away from some type of cataclysmic ongoing. That idea of a guaranteed income that allowed people to plan, particularly as you know hours were going down, is a part of a, a ongoing campaign and, and community change, again, in, in states and municipalities across the country where luckily we have elected officials and some amazing organizers across the nation who are saying there is another way. Uh, and so these are just some of the things that we have been a part of that, if I'm honest, you and Veach have been a part of um, with your continued support of these campaigns. Um, and I, I guess what I'll share here is just what's been amazing for me, particularly in New Mexico. Um, at, they had a, the organizers had a meeting the night before of the big ballot initiative vote. And, uh, several of the members were there, some of whom, because this I don't want to give fairy tales here, that this victory that I'm talking about is after a 12-year campaign for child care in that state. So several of the leaders who initiated that had kids who are now about to go to college. Talking to members who were new who had kids around my age, right, four or two, and who would benefit. And just the emotion and the storytelling of, I'm continuing to fight and hit doors tonight because I don't want any other parent or caregiver to have to go through the suffering that I went through of missing shifts because I couldn't afford childcare, bringing my kid into, leaving my kid in the car and praying that no one would call the police on me because I had to go to work. And that receipt to this next generation of caregivers and parents who are saying that I'm going to continue to knock doors and fight for this so that everyone can have it. So it's just, I guess those types of moments that we don't get to hear about as much in the day-to-day -day discourse of how difficult things are of people who have continued to fight even if they weren't going to directly benefit from it because they knew of what it was to be scared, more scared about losing your job or where your kid is going to be, saying that they didn't want anyone else to have that happen. Um, and I think the recharging, at least for me, that happens when I see that we could, if we can win it in New Mexico, we can win it everywhere. And that we can start having these difficult conversations about why we are making these fun choices on funding that are putting people in poverty when we don't have to. And so I've just been buoyed by it. I, I just feel excited to be able to share a little pieces of those that even in the midst of this, we still have some amazing folks um, here and across this nation who are gonna continue to fight. Uh, and I'm just glad to be in partnership with folks like you in this. Yeah. So, yeah. You know, and, and so much of, you know, much of what we're reflecting on today, um, it's come up in a few times this morning in this, in this sermon and, and now in this conversation that when these things get put forward, it's so clear that they're right, and yet there's something that's so impossible about them. And, it, and the people who are moving it are, are just dismissed as, you know, just this is not ever going to happen. And yet here we are 12 years later where people's lives are changing. And here we are 10 years later that people actually have a $15 and more minimum wage when at first that was like, that's never going to happen. And so I think it's really, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a really powerful, um, it's a really powerful to reflect on what that has looked like through 200 organizations funded by the Veach program that are part of this fabric. I want to just pause for a moment and see if we have any questions. Anybody would like to ask any questions? Yeah? I think. Anybody else? Yeah? Has community change done any work in Nassau County? Thank you for the question. I would, say, I would say not directly to my knowledge. We fund and work with several groups here in New York. I'll take a moment for a shameless plug for my old and Jones founded organization, Community Voices Heard, uh, which works closely here with partners in Long Island and trying to uh, rethink and, and reshape how families are able to live. Uh, but what I would say is indirectly through some statewide programs such as the, the fight, we were part of the fight for $15 an hour um, and currently, and then the fights on bail reform and some other pieces. The housing uh, work that CVH did in partnership with, like Make the Road and NYCC, I mean, that's super powerful. 
thank you, Joan. I would have literally gotten in a car and kicked myself. So <laughs> a little, when you talk about decades long, decades long campaign that we had here um, to reform the, the tenant protection laws in the state of New York, uh, which clearly impacted here in Long Island is something that Veach directly and community change also directly through partners uh, supported in, in 2019 one, to have some of the strongest tenant protections here in the state. Thank you. What other issues do you feel like the VEACH program should be paying attention to these days? Ooh, I appreciate the question. So I will say I've received VEACH as pretty much being um, on the cutting edge on a lot of these and, and not always looking by issue, but also growing and staying with the partners for the long fight. And let me just unpack what I mean by that. You know, I've mentioned several times both these campaigns and wins as being, you know, great stories on the win now, but most of them took more than a decade. Um, and so sadly, we've seen other institutions back away from funding in some places. Uh, for example, Florida, which is a place where Reach has partners just because things are this is we're gonna be honest here, difficult <laughs> right now in some aspects in Florida, but it's the time when people need support even more as they're continuing, as I would say, in the valley. And so I, I have seen Veach as funding uh, institutions and the communities they want to build, and that nine times out of 10, those institutions are multi-issue and have member bases that kind of help lead them to be clear on what the cutting issues are because of the issues that are directly impacting them at that moment. Other questions? Does your organization involve itself in addressing issues or injustices that are expressed or circulated online and social media or in media outlets? Ooh, this is a great question. Okay. Uh, I'm interpreting the, this a little bit as like what is our, and please feel free to correct me, our response, frankly, to, I want to articulate this well, but this kind of fake news and things that are perpetuating in the media. This is something that we have been discussing a lot, kind of what is our stake? And we see this as part of the pillars of, right, like fighting back against aspects of totalitarianism that are going on in the nation. So there's two pieces I'll say. One, you know, one thing that community change does is we, with our partners, try and support their communications, right? And let me just tell you what that means. As a person who came out of a state org, usually the comms person is the ED. <laughs> right, or the, the development person who does development communications check-in, right? It's usually you're the jack of all trades. So we've been working with our different partners and states to help them fine-tune their narrative, help them get their message out by using all the new mediums of media. So uh, for those who are aware of TikTok, right, we have these TikTok influencers. I think a great example, I'm so uh, grateful for this question, was around the guaranteed income fight. Um, and so we would have these influencers who were, you know, usually people follow them because they're funny, there's a cat on there or something, you know, and people follow them. And they'll just start talking about the issue at hand, right? They'll start talking about guaranteed income. Similar in Olay, we have the child care fight, we had TikTok influencers in Spanish and English talking about, hey, wouldn't it be nice if we had child care and they would do it in a funny way that would allow for some of the conversation to happen? So that's one aspect where we're seeing our kind of fight back. And then, as you've heard a little bit from Dorian this morning, you know, they are actively out, outdoors engaging in both on television and the media, as well as in op-eds, really trying to talk about how do we combat this piece where folks don't believe half of what's written or are believing things they clearly shouldn't. And so, you know, part of what we think our role to play in this is one, to continue to be a purveyor of truth by doing some small things is like actually citations and where we get things from, engaging directly with individuals and entities online who we know are purveyors of false news by reporting them, and then bringing, I think one of the important roles we play are convening to have, because this doesn't just affect us on the community change side and our partners, but from all sides, like what is our stake in this and how are we going to move forward? So it's absolutely something that is right in front of us as we talk larger about these issues of, of equality. Um, this, we'd say we're, again, for the third reconstruction, right, and democracy and all that it could hold, that it's not going to be where we need it to if we continue having um, this disbelief in media 
And so I'll say finally on that, but I also think it brings us to this tenet of um, connectivity. I talk, started talking about the one-to-ones, and I think part of this was able to permeate because of the isolation that we were in during COVID, right? Where folks were online and able to kind of go down those rabbit holes in a way where you're not in close relationship or company with people who can sometimes, you know, shake you between the shoulders and say, what the heck are you reading on there? That is not true. Um, and so part of this, I think, it goes to a basic tenet of organizing about the reconnections, about the one-to-ones, about people being together in a way that we've at times been unable to over the last three years. Okay, I'll ask two questions. First is, who are the members of Community Change, individuals or organizations? And the second is, um, is there a reaching out to young people in middle school and high school? Oh, thank you for those questions. So we are an organization uh, that relates to institutions. I'll say uh, something uh, interesting about community change is we don't have uh, members in the traditional sense where, or affiliates like in the labor union where you pay a certain amount of dues. We use the phrase partner because that's exactly what it is. We uh, meet with heads of organizations, confirm that we are values and mission aligned and make the you know, choices whether we want to partner together. And we have been blessed to be in long-term partnerships with organizations across the nation. So, and we find ourselves where there's mutual accountability about what we're going to embark upon together and, and how we move. And I'll say on the middle school and high school, no, not directly, through, through our partners. Some of our partners uh, focus on youth organizing, um, and that's part of what shaped us and how we've uh, engaged with them mostly through uh, the social media aspects that I was just referencing. What are you, um, just to follow up the question about the young people, what are you seeing on the ground in terms of the energy of young people to do formal organizing to make social change? So it has absolutely been um, amazing, particularly for me as a, a mom, but also just a person in the movement that what I, particularly even just coming out of Florida because the Miami Worker Center works with youth, it's been on several issues, right? Like um, student debt, which I'm hoping they win because I still owe Sally Mae a lot, so. Um, Student debt, um, guns, right? That when you think back to the March for Our Lives, some, uh, some partners we work with. And also, you know, just some of the destabilizations from COVID. Um, and some of our partner organizations, people lost their moms, they lost their grandparents, they lost um, elders who held a, a really particular role in their communities that destabilized them. So the, the manners in which I see youth in a new way engaging in issues of food security, um, access to affordable housing because we may have 18 year olds who are now the head of the household because they lost a parent or caregiver d during COVID. Um, so folks are, and of course climate. So, you know, I think we have a, a younger generation that is highly politicized in a good way, right? They're seeing things around them, they're questioning. Um, I, when I think of what uh, kind of politicized me and then seeing what's politicizing the youth now in COVID, and I'd be remiss if I didn't you know, mention the ongoing continuing, continued killing of black people at the hands of state institutions like the police continues to um, animate and politicize youth um, to demand something different. So it is both exciting, um, it kind of warms my heart when I see some young folks taken to the street and organizing actions, even in their schools. I'll continue to lift up Florida where their you know, youth are, are organizing in support of teachers in their schools, youth are organizing in universities saying like this is not gonna be in my name. Um, so it is amazing time to watch folks kind of again come together and take collective action and, and goals of something bigger than what we have now. And also, I really appreciate you know, where we started earlier with community change, investing more directly into the leadership of young people of color so that they can form cohorts, they can learn, they can move through a process together over time and build their skills. It's just so important. It's just, I'm just I'm hearing so much connection in what you're talking about. Um, and I think it really resonates with how we view the importance of, of, of a broad base of support across the country. Uh, for social change and social justice. I wonder if we have any uh, closing questions. Hmm? Hmm? Afia, anything else that you would like to share with us before we start to bring this 
this hour to a close. Well, I will just say again, a deep appreciation for being invited here today. And I would just, you know, lift up one more uh, example that is, um, kind of continued to move me forward into this new year as we're thinking about how we're going to build um, with whom and, and just this ongoing piece that continues to be kind of re-shown to me about how this is a long-term investment and walk with our partners. You know, after the, uh, uh, the release of the video uh, from the murder in Memphis, several of our partners who are part of um, the Black Led Organizing Initiative are coming together to do a public safety committee and to start to advance an agenda about reimagining public safety and what that can look like. So in the midst of this, we have groups from Tennessee, but also Akron, Ohio, where folks will remember the young man was murdered last year, uh, Florida, Georgia, North Carolina, who are coming together in community to both learn from each other, but also to put together an agenda. And so in times of, um, frankly, deep sadness um, and concern, it allows me to continue to move forward when I think about some of these amazing organizations who are coming together, who are creating open spaces for healing, uh, but also spaces of clarity for how we're gonna move forward and what we're gonna demand and how we're going to reshape and retool this nation to meet its better angels. So I am um, blessed and honored to be a part of that work and I am just deeply thankful for institutions like yours who are walking in their faith and, and walking shoulder to shoulder with us and so many 200 partners across the nation to help remake and remodel this nation into what we know it can be. So thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ophelia. Mm -hmm. Sure, I appreciate the question. So outside of the work that you're already doing as part of each, I'm gonna own my bias and say I always believe in joining institutions. And so there are amazing community-based institutions I know both here on the island, across the city and upstate who are doing the on-the-ground local work. And so I would just advise and engage, and if you'd like after, I'm happy to, if you tell me your zip code, I could probably name you three to four, um, who are doing the work. Um, and who are always excited to take in new folks, both in uh, their education and learning of how we do this, but also in the support. Uh, so I just appreciate the question. Thank you. Um, and, and I also just, um, you know, I appreciate also the question of what we can each do. And just to really appreciate that, you know, that Veach is really held in the congregation by a group of governors, most of whom are here right now, if not everyone here. Um, and it's just such a wonderful act of, of continued solidarity with the, with the Veach program and a connection to the congregation. So our hope is that on Veach Sunday that you can appreciate not only what's happening out in the world, but also what's happening inside of the congregation to ensure that this work uh, continues and continues to listen to really what's happening on the ground. So thank you, Afia. Thank you so much. Um, so I'm going to just turn it back over to uh, Kareen and, and again to just really appreciate you, Afia. It's been wonderful to spend this time with you today, um, to share with a congregation the work that, you're, that you've done and are doing, and to go forward together because there's so much work to be done. Thank you. Thank you, Joan, and thank you, Afia. And it's always been so, it's always wonderful to actually be able to hear you um, and to listen. And you teach us so much when you come and you're a part of, you know, spending the time and taking the energy, you know, that it takes out of these very busy lives that you, that you have. Um, it teaches us a lot and it really helps to motivate us and to move us forward. Um, and it's really wonderful. So you inspire us and uh, it really deepens our commitment that we have here to the work that we do. Um, so I want to now adjourn the meeting um, and I'm gonna ask Diane Lombardi to give closing words. May we see all as it is, and may it all be 
as we see it. May we, may we be the ones to make it as it should be. For if not us, who? If not now, when? This is answering the cry of justice with the work of peace. This is redeeming the pain of history with the grace of wisdom. This is the work we are called to do, and this is the call we answer now. To be the barrier and the bridge, to be the living embodiment of our principles, to be about the work of building the beloved community, to be a people of intention and a people of conscience. And might I just add here at the end a big thank you uh, to, to the governors, to the fantastic staff we have at Veach. Um, when we put the, an uh, event like this together, it takes a tremendous amount of time, energy, and actually opportunity to coordinate within our congregation, which has been a wonderful thing. So the staff um, that we have here today, you know, um, with Joe Maneri, Domenico Romero, maybe you've put your hand up in case people don't know you, Michelle Koval, and where's Eileen? Eileen Jamison over here. Um, they, they're fantastic in the work. We really appreciate your work <laughs> tremendously. And let me say, for the rest of the congregation, Carson Jones, for bringing the RE community um, together and for us having opportunities to come and speak, you know, to the, um, to the kids at times about the program is wonderful. Stephen Michael Smith and the choir, um, they always take that so seriously. Jen Zappel, um, Linda McCarthy, uh, you know, Reverend Natalie Fenimore, uh, you know, so many others here. Uh, thank you, um, because it really takes the village for us. And if I left anyone out, please forgive me, because thank you to everyone. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Kareen, and again, a big thank you to Afia Adamensa for spending her Sunday afternoon with us. Thank you so much, everyone. Enjoy the rest of your day.